Thank you everybody for joining us for another OpenShift Commons briefing in the All Things Data series. Today we have John Cope and Jeff Vance from the Red Hat CTO office, and they are the key drivers for object bucket provisioning in Kubernetes. So we're very excited to have you here. Please take it away. Hi, my name is John Cope, uh, and along with my colleague Jeff Vance, we've been working on object bucket provisioning for uh, quite a while now. And it started off as a small project and has grown into a much bigger community-supported project uh, that we're going to be talking about here today. Uh, so this initially uh, started off as a in-house uh, solution uh, to the lack of an object storage API in Kubernetes. Uh, at the time, there has there wasn't, and there uh, still not uh, isn't a, an API that allows a normal interaction with object storage for provisioning of buckets um, for any vendors. Uh, and as a result, managers often have to go out of band or out of Kubernetes to manage their uh, bucket quotas, their storage quotas, and to manage cost. They have to handle user pol policy out of band, attaching users and roles to buckets uh, through the vendor's interface. Uh, it adds a, an extra layer of complexity to the system, and it creates this inconsistent uh, workflow for users who have to figure out on their own how to inject connection and credential information into their pods or their workloads. Uh, this creates, we feel, some security holes uh, when a user or an administrator has to go outside of Kubernetes, get their credentials, and then inject them into the work workload manually. And of course, this at scale becomes incredibly difficult to manage. And I just wanted to mention, because I just remembered it now, um, people do use service catalog um, or did for um, provisioning buckets, but um, A, that's been deprecated, and B, it was a fairly cumbersome method. Uh, there's a lot of moving pieces in service catalog, and so it wasn't very popular. Okay, John. Yeah, no, that's a good point, Jeff. Thanks. Uh, admin, or, uh, admin user stories that we had imagined uh, as a guide for our, uh, our target design implementation here were to be to allow uh, administrators to control uh, resources, that is uh, storage resources, bucket, uh, bucket size, uh, the, the amount of buckets, the amount of users who can connect to a specific bucket and who those users are. Uh, in order to control costs uh, and uh, represent their uh, security policies at the Kubernetes layer. Uh, and we also want to normalize the interactions that administrators and users would have with object store vendors through Kubernetes. From the user perspective, we want to simplify uh, the onus on them to describe their workloads in their uh, YAML specifications. and just as they can do a PVC or a uh, persistent volume definition in a YAML along with their pod, we want to make that possible for bucket provisioning so that they can say, don't start my workload until this bucket is ready, create this bucket, and then when it's ready, give me the connection information and inject it into the uh, workload in this way. So we, we want to automate the entire process and keep them from having to go out of band either through the CLI or a web GUI to create their bucket and get their credential. And we also want to make it possible to some extent to make these uh, workload specifications portable, assuming that the backing object store vendor supports the same protocol. So if they're moving from, say, AWS S3 to a uh, on-prem cluster running Ceph, their workload should still run without any modifications. So to touch on some of the goals of the project, we want to uh, create a control plane within Kubernetes and OpenShift for buckets. Uh, I call a control here because what we I want to explicitly say we're not replacing or abstracting uh, the actual object store vendor protocols. That is S3, GCS, Azure Blob. Uh, so users will still be using those SDKs. We want to normalize the experience of provisioning the buckets. We want to provide vendors a easy onboarding uh, experience when they're writing their provisioners. So this will be much like C uh, CSI, uh, written against a GR gRPC interface with a handful of uh, methods that a vendor would write, and it abstract away 
all of the uh, Kubernetes uh, controller framework so that provisioner authors don't have to be Kubernetes experts when they're writing these provisioners. And to touch on non-goals as well, we do not want to define, as I said, a native object store protocol. Uh, that is something we're hoping to enable with this project, and it's something that has been talked about as a, a stretch goal um, following this project, but uh, currently that's not something we're trying to solve. Uh, we're not trying to make it possible to lean on the, the first point to shift your workloads between object store protocols. So if you're uh, shifting from Azure to AWS S3 and you're using the Azure SDK, we're not trying to make it possible to magically drop that into AWS and make that work. Uh, that's not something that this project is trying to solve. And lastly, we're not trying to orchestrate the infrastructure of object stores. That is the spinning up of uh, actual physical storage and the deploying of uh, say Ceph, uh, Ceph object onto uh, nodes with storage. Uh, I'd recommend if you're looking for something like that, checking out Rook.io. Uh, that does a very good job of orchestrating that kind of stuff, and they do have support for Ceph. Uh, some of the history of this project. So as I said earlier, this started off as a, a kind of a small in-house solution has grown since. Uh, as a result of its origins, we opted for a library that would be imported into projects and that library would wrap uh, the Kubernetes controller logic, and we, we would ask vendors just to write to it an interface that we had defined. This had some pretty significant limitations that weren't a problem for our in-house solutions, but as we started to see a bigger community uh, interest in this, uh, the broader Kubernetes community, uh, we started to see some of the real limitations here. Uh, namely one, every time a library update occurred, uh, so a bug was fixed or a feature was added, those provisioners had to be rebuilt because it was a dependency, a code dependency of those provisioners. Um, the design itself used config maps and secrets to represent a single bucket. And at scale, that becomes pretty unmanageable because you've doubled the amount of uh, objects you have to manage per bucket. It was Kubernetes specific, whereas a CSI-like uh, model with a gRPC interface can actually be implemented for any container orchestration platform. And of course, as a result of being written in Go, uh, it required that anyone that depended on it write their provisioners in Go, which again, wasn't a big issue for us. We, at the time, uh, were only writing to projects that already had, or were already based in Go. And of course, with Go, especially in older Go, dependency management was a real problem prior to Go module projects. and we ended up spending a lot more time, an increasing amount of time, uh, deconflicting uh, dependencies. And lastly, we didn't have support for it at the Kubernetes community at the time. So coming to today, with the uh, enhancement proposal, we've got a pull request open for against uh, Kubernetes. Uh, it's led by Jeff and myself, and we have support for it within uh, SIG storage, and are working closely with uh, uh, some of the chairs on SIG storage to really get this moving through. And what it proposes a, a native Kubernetes, you know, community maintained API. And what that means is that uh, the conversation has been around making this an API that is not an external uh, to the core Kubernetes API. It would be part of core. It would be referenceable from within say pods and deployments and things like that. Uh, and that would, the, the benefit of that would be pretty large for one. Uh, it would significantly cut down the amount of uh, extra API objects required to manage uh, each bucket. Uh, we would have a single bucket object per uh, per bucket rather than a secret and config map, and that bucket could be referenced by a pod. Uh, we um, some of these I've already mentioned before. Uh, we separate container uh, Kubernetes orchestration from the provisioner code. So via this gRPC interface, provisioners could write their uh, or provisioner authors rather, could write the provisioners in any language that's supported by gRPC, which uh, there's a list of 20 or more. Uh, so they're not tied to Go. They don't have to learn Go to write a provisioner. This significantly simplifies upgrades. The uh, cozy sidecar, just like in CSI, uh, would run in its own container. Uh, 
So whenever an update, a bug fix, a feature uh, would come out for it, it wouldn't be a matter of having to re-ingest it, deconflict dependencies, rebuild your provisioner, and then deploy that. Uh, it would just be updating your sidecar container version, and you're good to go. And probably most importantly, as I had said already, uh, we have support within SIG storage for this. Uh, the pretty significant support, in fact. The We had been invited to talk about this uh, at the uh, at last year's KubeCon. We've gotten a lot of support from the uh, technical chairs on this and are holding weekly meetings uh, to move this along, improve on the API so that we can get the cap merged and begin designing the, uh, uh, the lower level uh, implementations. To dive into the design itself a little bit, uh, we're looking at introducing three new API objects, a bucket, bucket content, and bucket class. The bucket is similar to a PVC. It's a user-created object. It's a, uh, it triggers the provisioning of a new bucket uh, by the uh, sidecar and the, the uh, provisioner, defined, or provisioner authored driver. The bucket content uh, is analogous to a persistent volume. It represents a cluster scoped uh, administrative sign uh, of the bucket containing bucket metadata that you don't necessarily want users to be privy to. And bucket classes, very similar to storage classes, provide a, a object store tailored uh, API to represent a set of uh, parameters that users would reference from their bucket object. As an MVP, we want to support uh, three separate cases for buckets, Greenfield being the creation of new buckets on demand uh, by users, so those would be brand new empty buckets. Uh, Brownfield, we want to automate the credentialing of users for buckets that were created out of band, uh, such that when they create a bucket object, they still get back a set of new credentials tied to that bucket. And of course, static, the case being that uh, a driver has not yet been written for that object store, uh, uh, provi or rather a provisioner does not exist for that object store. And administrators would have to manually create the uh, bucket content objects, but Cozy would still handle uh, automation such that when a bucket's created, a set of credentials, which would be defined by the administrator in a secret, would still be copied to that user's namespace and cleaned up uh, when they delete their bucket object. Uh, so what we see this uh, doing for our customers is enabling a couple of use cases at least. Uh, hybrid cloud uh, being a big push for the uh, Red Hat right now. Uh, with these portable APIs, it would make it a lot easier for users to pick their workloads up out of one cloud provider and drop them in another. Assuming, of course, that uh, the protocol, the uh, object store protocol remains the same. Uh, so the early exam earlier example I gave was picking up from AWS and dropping it on-prem to a Ceph object. That should be a, a seamless action that doesn't require any changes to the spec. Uh, there has been um, uh, some talk around backup and uh, disaster recovery operations. And object storage really enables orchestration of, of periodic backup and, and disaster recovery stuff. Namely, uh, the fact that it provides versioned immutable uh, data storage makes it a real prime uh, solution to store uh, the backed up information. By normalizing the uh, object storage provisioning, we enhance those, those efforts and make them a lot more portable across uh, cloud providers. And lastly, it uh, provides a nice streamlined way for uh, applications that are very reliant on object storage now, namely uh, AIML and serverless apps, uh, to be written and to be deployed uh, on Red Hat products or on, on cloud uh, providers without having to become an expert in that object storage. And I just want to say thank you for listening to the web, uh, webinar. Um, again, my name is John Cope. I, uh, my colleague is Jeff Vance. We would love for you to reach out to us if you have any questions or uh, comments. If you have used store, user stories uh, that you think we should know about, we'd love to hear from you. Um, we hold weekly meetings on the review that are public. Uh, if you join the Kubernetes SIG storage Google group, you'll automatically get invites for those. And please feel free to jump over on the actual pull request
and take a look at the document itself. Uh, we'd love to get some feedback, some criticisms. Uh, if there's something we missed and we need to know about, we'd love to hear that too. Uh, thank you. Thank you, John. And Jeff, does anybody else have any other questions? I see that um, Rob has been putting into the chat some questions around how um, infrastructure specific APIs are merged with Kubernetes. Jeff, um, Rav, do you want to take this conversation into out of the chat and um, talk about it live? Yes, yeah, yeah, Karina, that's a good idea because I don't, I don't really understand what he means uh, by an infrastructure API. Uh, there is a question regarding the specific APIs. Uh, uh, each infrastructure, specifically, let's say AWS, Azure, or uh, oh, that's uh, what you mean. Yeah, uh, they have the specific uh, APIs for the uh, with the Kubernetes integrated, and uh, I, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't understand how this is actually integrated with the OpenShift. So, um, so like John mentioned, um, you, and, and you're right, uh, Google Cloud, Microsoft uh, Cloud, uh, Amazon Cloud, they all have a different SDK and therefore different APIs uh, that you use. If you were outside of Kubernetes and you're trying to uh, create buckets, list buckets, add to buckets, et cetera, delete them, um, and they're not the same. Um, that is the problem with buckets. There's no POSIX. There's no IEEE standard for buckets, and um, and that's why Kubernetes hasn't addressed it yet. That's what John mentioned about the data plane or those protocols. We are not standardizing that in this um, enhancement here. Um, there is discussion, very light discussion in that area, but nothing solid yet. Um, what we're trying to do is manage the, uh, what we call the control plane, that you can use cube control um, to create resources that will be a request for a bucket, um, and that, that there's a abstraction of buckets, and that there's a single consistent way of managing buckets um, through Kubernetes. Uh, quotas could be applied and, and, and the, the, the high-level bucket is a first-class Kubernetes resource now. So that, that's what we're trying to do. But, it, but because there's not a consistent data plane, you can't take an application written using AWS SDK for your buckets. Because um, that app knows it's using the AWS bucket API. You can't take that app and just stick it on Google Cloud and expect it to work just because the control plane is the same. In other words, your applic you, you create this claim, this request for a bucket, with, which is the bucket CRD that John mentioned. That part's the same, but underneath you'd be referencing a different bucket class that would have a different driver. It would be a Google driver, not an Amazon driver, and so forth. So that app can't be portable across different bucket stores. Does that explain it better? Yeah, it does explain better, but I still don't understand how. Uh, so you're saying we we're putting those drivers from each uh, infrastructure specific, and merging with the KWS. Uh, I no, I don't believe so. So the what we're describing, uh, in the same vein as CSI, would be that AWS or you know someone supporting AWS would write their AWS driver. That would be. Uh, likely stored within six, a six storage managed repository or project, uh, but managed or but maintained by you know the authors of uh, that driver and and perhaps other people within six storage. This would not the drivers themselves would not be part of core Kubernetes code. The knowledge about the infrastructure uh, would be abstracted through the bucket content and the bucket class, uh, such that and uh, this is a yeah, as Jeff pointed out, we we can't lean on a a universal uh, interface like POSIX um, to to have a more specifically defined uh, bucket content API. So we we offer a bit of leeway with data blobs that administrators will still have to define, and drivers will have to ingest. So we, as part of the design, expect drivers to very clearly document the parameters they require to operate or, or allow uh, to be configured by administrators. And then they will use that to operate on 
whatever uh, vendor or, or uh, object store they're written for. Thank you. Yes, thank and you very much. That was a great discussion. We've had some more discussion in the um, the chat. Aaron, do you want to jump in really fast and mention why this is replacing the object bucket claim? Sure. So the object bucket claim, which we introduced last year, which I think a lot of hatters are using, was based on uh, lib bucket provisioner. Um, so using the idea of external provisioners just to create that storage. Um, and since then, the community has wanted to pivot more towards a CSI implementation because that's how all um, data will be accessed within uh, the Kubernetes infrastructure. And with that, the community wanted to go with a different naming convention. Um, there was pretty strong opinion about that, given that if they could go back in time, they would have changed the, the PV, PVC nomenclature. So hence, that's why the name is different. So the object bucket claim and bucket was used before. Um, these are, are, it's going to be somewhat of the same, but not as tracking as closely to the PV, PVC, which is unfortunate in our case. I mean, we liked being able to relate that as an admin understanding that's the way you consume other types of storage, but um, we'll take what we can get. So I hope that yeah. helps clarify it. Yeah, to add what Aaron said, I mean, uh, and, and there's a chat conversation on this. You know, the library design had an OBC, which was an object bucket claim. That's what you see in OpenShift documentation and Rook documentation, and people are familiar with that because it's it sounds like a PVC. But when you really think about it, it's 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 fairly different. Um, when you have a pod, your pod will represent, your pod references a claim. It represents a PVC. And then that PVC in turn um, will reference a storage class. And that's how you get to the, the, the external provision or the driver or the dynamic provisioning of your underneath storage. But the, the important part is the pod referenced the claim. And we don't have that with an OBC. The pod you have an OBC and it's it's separate from the pod. There's no place in the pod where it references that OBC. So the analogy falls short with the library design. And the SIG storage, and most importantly, as Aaron said, SIG storage would not, they did not like that naming. In fact, they said that if they were starting all over, they wouldn't have called it a PVC. They don't think it plain is the right word. You don't call it a pod claim because you want a, um, you want to abstract a workload. And so they, there was fairly strong encouragement from SIG Storage for us to follow the naming conventions of the new snapshot feature. And that's what we've done in this, in this KEP. Thank you. I mean, that's really interesting. <laughs> I'm so glad I'm here to listen to this. And looks like others are as well going from the chat. So thank you all for joining us and you know giving us an update on object bucket provisioning and all the great work that you're doing upstream. With that, quick announcement for everybody, we'll have another session next week, same time for the All Things Data series. And thank you everybody for joining us again.